Hi everyone. I got a little overexcited about my topic because um, as some of you guys know, I um, actually suffer from or live with chronic illness. And um, also it's one of the specialization specialties I would like to have is working with patients with chronic pain and chronic illness. So I asked Professor Ken if I could, um, instead of doing a pure psychological disorder, do this disorder that is on the cusp of psychological and physical. And I'll explain what I mean. Um, and I'll probably take off my face now. Okay, so is fibromyalgia a psychological disorder or not? Um, what, first of all, what is fibromyalgia? It's a chronic pain condition um, that's sort of uh, uh, seen as widespread pain. So it's not just like one region or one arm. It's like you feel pain all over. Um, it often comes with a whole host of other symptoms such as fatigue, uh, sleep disturbances, uh, stiffness, non-restful sleep, like you wake up exhausted, uh, cognitive dysfunction, sort of a fibro fog, oftentimes GI dysfunction. But it's, it's considered medically unexplained pain. And so it's one of those diagnoses that people uh, feel dubious about. Um, historically, it's been, been dismissed as psychogenic. Psychogenic means um, it's a psychological, not a physical problem, uh, because no physical problem for the pain could be found until now. Like now, they finally, new research has finally figured out what is causing fibromyalgia. So just a little history, the disorder was first described in 1818 as a tissue disorder. Um, they thought maybe it was in the, in the tissues, but for the most part, it's a, it's a diagnosis that's associated with women. And as we know, women in history um, have not regularly been believed, right? So most women who complained of the disorder um, suffered or were considered to be hypochondriacs, malingerers, psychologically imbalanced, um, or hypersensitive, right? So you, you had like they whisked these women off to the sea in the 1800s uh, for rest and relaxation. My grandmother, um, almost 100% positive, she had fibromyalgia, she had the same symptoms. Um, she was considered to be depressed um, and by her doctor and just prescribed Valium until she died of a heart attack because nobody believed her that she was having her symptoms. Um, but that's another story. So fiber, the term fibromyalgia uh, was first used in 76, but it started to be used in the 1980s by rheumatologists. So if you're wondering what specialization this is in, it's usually rheumatology, but every, everybody claims their share of it. It's considered a non-articulate disorder, meaning it's not a joint, it's not arthritis, but it, it, it's in the muscles, or the pain seems to be muscular. Um, even though we, uh, we've been talking about it for 200 years, it did not receive its own diagnostic code until 2015, which is kind of insane. And before then, um, in, in the DC, the ICD-9, it was just called myalgia unspecified. It didn't have its own name. Okay, so the diagnostic criteria, this is considered to be um, a, an actual disorder, um, but it is a disorder of exclusion. So to have it, you have to have widespread pain lasting three months or more, a presence of one of the other symptoms that I mentioned before, um, and pain is not explained by another condition. Well, that's tricky. So you have to do a lot of um, diagnoses and treatment to see if pain is caused by another condition. Um, so the rule outs are um, whether the person has an autoimmune disease that explains the pain instead, like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, um, whether they have mental health issues such as depression or anxiety, which can cause pain, or whether they have neurological disorders such as MS. Now, here's the tricky part. You can have fibromyalgia and autoimmune diseases and mental health diagnosis and neurological disorders. So usually to get finally diagnosed, you have to start to treat all the other things. And then if there's pain left over, we'll call it fibromyalgia. Um, something that's very important to keep in mind that we will address later is it has a super high comorbidity with PTSD. So people with trauma have fibromyalgia more than people without trauma. 
Okay, um, so brand new science in the last few years is coming out is finally starting to solve the mystery of fibromyalgia, but it's very complex, so we're not there. We don't have a cure or anything. But the new science shows, and this is completely ironic, that it is actually all in your head, but not in the way that it's made up. So what I mean by that is they're discovering that fibromyalgia is a disease of the central nervous system. Um, so persons with fibromyalgia, we'll call them PWFs, they feel pain in their legs and arms, but there's no actual injuries there. So if they go to the doctor and you see this um, graphic on the bottom of the thighs or the back of the legs and their legs hurt, and then they take x-rays or they do massage, they can't find any knots, they don't find any uh, injuries, they can't figure out why you know, all their tests come back normal. There's no reason why the legs should hurt. And that's because the brain is telling the legs to hurt. And so there actually is pain in the legs, but it is not caused by the tissues in the legs, um, which makes it incredibly hard to treat. Um, so in this sense, pain is from the brain. Now, when I first learned this, someone says, well, does that mean it's not real? And the thing is, all pain basically is comes from the brain, right? Like without the brain, we wouldn't experience any pain, even if we have painful stimulus. So, um, you know, is it real or not? Is anything real that's been filtered by their brain? So yes, the experience of pain is very real. Um, so just in, briefly, here's the neuroscience of pain. No, I'm just kidding. I added that in there just to give you a, a sense of just how very complicated the neurobiology of pain is. Um, it's very complicated to figure out. People have many, many more years of research uh, to even be able to get at this. Um, but I will try to simplify the best I can what I understand of what's happening in fibromyalgia and how it relates to psychological disorders. Okay, so first let me tell you the normal pain processing system. So in a, in a normal body, um, you have something called ascending pathways and descending pain pathways. Ascending pain pathways means you feel a stimulus from the outside, right? Somebody, you get a thorn in your finger. Um, there's a stimulus in your finger, the nerves go all the way up your arm, and then they go up your uh, spinal column to the brain, right? That's the ascending pathway. The brain receives this and interprets the information. Receives it, says, oh, pain, that means something, we should do something about it, or whatever the brain decides to do. Now, descending pain pathways is that all of our bodies, when they function right, have built-in pain relief. So once the pain signal has been received, there's no point to leave a person in debilitating pain. So immediately releases pain inhibitory neurons. So the pain inhibitory neurons um, are the monamines that, that we've come to love so much in our um, pharm psychopharmacology class, serotonin, norepinephrine. Um, these, uh, they get released and they immediately sort of calm down the system. So what that means is normal people walking around actually only experience a fraction of the original pain stimuli. So um, yeah, it, it, it immediately sort of releases. So in this way, they say that people with fibromyalgia are hypersensitive, but actually normal people are very, hmm, what do I want to say, under sensitive in that sense, because they have uh, pain reduction, pain inhibitory functions that reduce and block the pain that is coming through. So in fibromyalgia, there are dysfunctions in both the ascending and the descending pain process. Um, as uh, one doctor called it, the same stimuli but more pain. So it's not that people with fibromyalgia have more things wrong with them physically or more uh, signals of pain coming in, it's how they process it. So persons with fibromyalgia have two malfunctions. First, in the ascending pain pathways, uh, what's interesting here is the idea that, and, and this is probably how it ties into trauma, for whatever reason, the pain pathways have been overstimulated. Either they've been damaged or they've been overused, uh, but something has gone awry. Um, and what happens is, and I'm not gonna get into the whole glial and cytokines, <laughs> it's a, it gets very complicated. But the overview is that instead of pain signal coming in from your finger and your brain goes, oh, it's my finger, the neurons start to all talk to each other. They get overexcited and there's sort of neuron crosstalk. 
And what it means is you can no longer really figure out where exactly the pain is from. And instead it signals all the pain all over the body. Um, so it, interpret, it interprets localized pain stimuli to widespread pain throughout the body. Um, an example, a, uh, a metaphor that's been used by doctors to explain it, it's like a radio is always on with screeching noise 24 seven. And then the noise comes through, right? Well, you don't, you don't really know where it is and you're already kind of like overreacting to everything and, it, and everything becomes way more and more irritating um, and, and right. So this one little thing, this one little sound coming through just adds to the overall level of like, ah, right, too much. The second malfunction, um, unfortunately, is the descending pathways where the good shit happens. Good shit comes from pain inhibitory pathways um, get damaged or weakened. So um, in, this, in this graph on the right, you have pain stimulus. And then in the normal people, uh, they call, you know, I won't go through what everything is, but they call up the pain inhibitory things and they go through all these pathways and then bam, start sending out the feel good, um, feel good neurotransmitters like serotonin. Um, and then your perception of pain is lightened for whatever reason that we have not figured out yet. People with fibromyalgia have fewer pathways. So the mechanism gets triggered to send out pain inhibitory stuff, but there just aren't the pathways. All of a sudden there's like two pathways instead of a set of eight on the other side. So there's fewer inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters, feel good stuff going out. And thus the perception of pain becomes much greater. So yeah, significantly less pain inhibiting monamines released to the system and thus pain all over and at a much higher volume than normal people. So think of it as, yeah, a radio with the volume turned up. In normal people, that volume gets turned down and you can ignore it or it goes even between the threshold of your hearing. Um, in people with fibromyalgia, the volume's turned all the way up. And the mechanism that's supposed to turn it down doesn't work. <laughs> Please excuse my terrible, uh, terrible artwork, but I think it's hilarious. Okay, so now that we know that fibromyalgia is in the central nervous system, it makes so much sense why so many treatments for fibromyalgia have failed. Um, one thing that doesn't work in, say, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, right? Doctors are always sending patients home to take ibuprofen, to take um, Tylenol, to take... Um, Oh God, what's the other one? Naproxen, right? These don't cross the blood-brain barrier and thus they're not actually gonna help because they're not addressing the central nervous system. Um, other things that don't work are localized treatment of pain. So even though massage may help overall reduce stress, it doesn't actually reduce pain unless you have secondary pain from a problem there. Um, also, People with fibromyalgia have got like injections, like lidocaine injections into certain joints. Again, does not ultimately solve the pain problem because the pain is not coming from that area. Instead, um, most of what's considered the successful or the FDA approved treatments for fibromyalgia are actually psych meds, right? So even though it's a, not a psychological problem and it's not, um, it's not necessarily a psychological problem the psych meds that we have already start to address some of the problems. So in the descending pain process, remember I talked about that there's a, a not enough serotonin and neuroepinephrine being released. Well, antidepressants happen to do those things. So meds that increase pain inhibitory neurotransmitters um, are then used to treat fibromyalgia like tricyclics, SSRIs, SNRIs, muscle relaxants like flexorol. Um, sometimes benzodiazepines, opioids in the short term, we know it has long-term problems, and gabapentin that works on the GABA function. Um, yeah, so the idea is if we increase, even though the body's not sending it out, if we increase, increase the amounts that are available, perhaps it will reduce the pain. Now, of course, the stigma comes back when you go to the doctor for pain and he gives you an antidepressant, you can get really pissed off. Like, I'm not... I'm not depressed, I, I'm suffering, right? Um, though you can be depressed and have fibromyalgia. 
uh, but that's not why they're prescribing them. They're prescribing them for hope that they're going to try to work on those those areas. Now, of all the drugs that are given for fibromyalgia that are like, you know, Lyrica, you see commercials for Lyrica and everything else, they reduce pain about 20 to 25% max in, in the clients that it works for. So if you have a patient with fibromyalgia who has a 10 out of 10 pain level, then taking Cymbalta will bring them to an 8 out of 10 pain level, right? Which, hey, it's better than 10 out of 10, but certainly not a cure. Um, and then you have, have to balance with the side effects. As we know, all of these drugs have side effects. Is it worth that reduction of pain or not? Um, there's new promising meds for the ascending pain pathways, right? The question is, yeah, why did the uh, why was there that weird crosstalk of the neurons in the first place? Why was this original freak out? Um, and one of the drugs I have a picture over here about cytokine storms. So um, there's a there's an idea that there's too many pro-inflammatory cytokines floating around. Um, and a drug that we've heard about and for treating opioid abuse, naltrexone, um, turns out at a lower dose, so they use like 50 milligrams to get people off of heroin, but on a lower dose actually does the stuff that nobody expected. So it's an opioid blocker, which seems like it's going to be bad for pain, but it actually quiets some of that neuron crosstalk. That it, it inhibits pro-inflammatory cytokines. Now this is interesting to me because if you've been following COVID, um, one of the one of the things about COVID um, that kills people, they think, is the cytokine storm in the immune system. Um, and the fact that I got COVID and I have a number of high risk factors, perhaps I didn't die because I am taking a cytokine inhibitor. So that's my hope on that. Now here's the thing, it's an amazing drug, but it only reduces pain 30% in those that works on, which is about 60% of clients. So it reaches more clients with more pain reduction, but it's clearly not the cure for fibromyalgia. Um, so, what to do? Can we intervene more holistically? Doctors know that pharma is limited. They know that their understanding of the brain is limited. Um, I think what we learn from uh, Professor Kent's uh, lectures is most of the time they don't know why, <laughs> what the function, the, the mechanism is um, in the drugs, or they can't target it. They have to just sort of scattershot it. Uh, so pharma is limited on central nervous system pain. So one of the questions is, why is the radio or why is the um, um, overstimulation stuck on in the first place? Can we work at that level? So this is one of the reasons that, that people think fibromyalgia and trauma are so closely related. Um, those of you who, who know about trauma or, or spend some time learning about the autonomic nervous system, um, hopefully that you've heard about the um, the autonomic nervous system is the sympathetic system, which is your fight or flight. And then you have the parasympathetic system, which is rest and digest, right? And we have to balance these. Uh, one set of chemicals boosts us up, and the other set sort of brings us down when the danger is passed. And the theory with people with fibromyalgia, um, and then the same with people with PTSD, is that the sympathetic system gets stuck on or it gets overutilized, right? The neural pathways get overutilized, and so we too often go to this system when it's not needed um, and then underutilize or under um, stimulate the parasympathetic system. So what that means is that complementary and alternative medicine and psychological interventions could actually help with fibromyalgia. So even though it's not a psychological disorder, psychological techniques could help uh, because Number one, we just don't have the better stuff to work. Um, so psychology and non-Western medicine has all kinds of things that we, we've started to recognize um, that we need to modulate our body stress response. Um, trauma therapies, EMDR, somatic experiencing, DBT, which helps with emotional dysregulation, uh, biofeedback, mindfulness and meditation, and even things like exercise, but you have to be careful with fibromyalgia, nutrition, sleep hygiene. These are all things that start to bring that system back into balance, where instead of being hyper-aroused all the time, um, it's aroused when it needs to be and it calms down when it needs to be. And so if we can heal at that level, 
perhaps that original freak out with the pain signals um, won't happen. Now, as far as I know, nobody's officially been cured of fibromyalgia, so I don't know. But this brings us to what can we do as a therapist? What can therapists do? Um, validate. Okay, so even though there's things we can do to help people, I, I cannot emphasize this enough. Validate, validate, validate. Believe your client. Uh, just so you know, if you have a client with fibromyalgia, here's what um, is true about them according to some studies. Usually they wait about at least a year to seek help because um, they don't think anyone will believe them or appreciate it. Um, it takes a, a average of two to three more years to receive a diagnosis. Um, and on average, they have to visit at least three different doctors to find someone who can diagnose them properly. Then once they are diagnosed, they continue to face hostility from doctors. Um, so a study of doctor attitudes about fibromyalgia found that many of them don't believe in fibromyalgia and they, can, and they think that people um, with fibromyalgia over-exaggerate their sy symptoms, they're hypersensitive, they're lazy, they're work shy, they refuse to get well. So even though they're giving them treatments, they just aren't getting well. So they assume that the problem is in the patient and not within their treatments and that they're overly identified with illness because they just keep talking about this problem. Right? So if you get a client who has fibromyalgia, they are used to being not believed, to being um, um, dismissed, to having people try to tell them to think positively and to stop just dwelling in their illness all the time, right? So they're going to come with some medical trauma. Here's how you can validate them. It turns out that there's another study and I don't have all my citations in here. It's in my paper. I could put them. But people with uh, fibromyalgia whose pain is believed and validated actually experience lower levels of pain and shorter flare cycles. And people who are criticized or not believed for their pain actually experience increased levels of pain for longer periods of time. So even just on the basis of what works, validation and uh, compassion works. Um, other things that therapists can do then is to help uh, people with fibromyalgia develop supportive social structures. It's not just doctors who don't believe um, in fibromyalgia, uh, loved ones, family members, friends, right? Friends get super frustrated. Why can't you do this thing with me? Um, why, why could you go to work, but you can't come to my birthday? Um, you know, I saw you go shopping, but you didn't do this thing. And the idea is that uh, people with fibromyalgia have limited abilities and um, energy. And so you can turn them on to um, um, ideas like Spoonies, if there's like a whole um, theory and there's groups that support it that, you know, people have a different amount of energy to spend or spoons to spend each day. Um, and they can use that as a way to communicate with their loved ones. Um, also boundary setting. A lot of people with fibromyalgia do it anyways, and then they um, crash and burn and then they're sick for a long time. Um, so teaching them, teaching them how to say no, right? So I put this great meme, when you ask me what I'm doing today and I say nothing, it does not mean I'm free. It means I'm doing nothing, right? That is my goal for today. Um, and, and helping them communicate and educate people around them. The second thing that I think could be really super helpful and I, really important to me, like if, if nothing else in this presentation gets through, this is the thing that's most important to me, and that is reframing fibromyalgia. Okay, so you need to know that fibromyalgia, and I mentioned this before, has a deep social stigma, and there's all kinds of moralizing about it, right? So fibromyalgia patients are often blamed for their own illness, and this comes from way back early Judeo-Christian traditions uh, saw pain or illness as punishment for sin, right? So the notion that somebody's in pain or that someone is sick is somehow bad is in our collective psyches. It's in our collective unconsciousness. And it keeps being projected onto people with fibromyalgia, okay? So it turns out that, you know, I gave you that list of lifestyle changes that can help. And once people believe that you could do all those things, uh, now people are blamed for it, right? So my mom has fibromyalgia also. So she'll be going along and then she'll have a flare up and get sick. And the first thing she'll say is, what did I do wrong? 
I must have done something wrong to get sick. I must have eaten something bad. I must have done too much, right? So even though there's lifestyle changes that may help, we need to keep in mind as therapists, they did not cause fibromyalgia and they will not cure fibromyalgia. They just help you modulate it. So if a client is still sick or if a client is sick again, it is not because they're bad or immoral or lazy people or they're not doing enough, right? These things are all experimental at best and trying to find what works for people. Um, you know, there's people who've been living with fibromyalgia for 30, 40 years and they're trying everything. Um, so the idea that people are not, are lazy is, is um, does not hold up to be true across the whole board. So in our culture today, the, the modern day equivalent of um, that Christian uh, moralizing art is toxic positivity, or you get these wellness bros, right? And wellness bros are the ones who, um, you know, will sell you the, the kale, whatever, but then vote for Trump because they believe like do it yourself. Um, so toxic positivity is that sense that you have to always be happy, always have positive thinking. Um, if you don't expect the best, you're not gonna get the best. If you imagine the best, you'll get everything. Nothing's impossible. Never give up. Um, validation and support says, you know, sometimes give up. It depends on what your goal is, right? Um, like if your goal is to finish a degree and keep your sanity, sometimes you drop a class, you know? Um, and so, yeah, we have to be careful about that toxic positivity. The other thing you should know is that people with chronic illness get unsolicited advice all the time. And people love to um, uh, simplify the problem. So even if all of these things can be helpful, um, no one thing cures fibromyalgia or we would have fucking cured fibromyalgia. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to get upset, but this is just so you know, okay. So I took this from a thread on Facebook recently and it started with this tweet. I'd love to start a what's the worst advice you've ever been given for chronically ill people, but we all know it's yoga, right? So why don't you just try yoga, flower essences, kale, aromatherapy, magnets, IV vitamins, vitamin D, B12 shots, magnesium, calcium, potassium, coconut oil colonics, turmeric, uh, anti-inflammatory diets, keto, gluten-free, vegan, CBT, THC, pineapple extract, holy water, bee sting therapy, past life healing, Reiki, juicing, sleep more, sleep less, contrastive hydrotherapy, positive outlook, heavy metal detox, abstaining from pharmaceuticals, uh, releasing guilt, drink more water, have more sex, socialize more, be less negative. Right. All of these things can be helpful, but clearly no one thing, even if your sister-in-law did it and it cured her fibromyalgia, every client is different. Every human body is different. And that brings me to the second idea in reframing fibromyalgia. And that is that um, if we start to look at fibromyalgia, not as an illness, but a disability, um, it can actually become a very positive identity. So the recent movements in disability uh, comes from a social justice model. Um, so the first thing we have to know and reaffirm for our clients is fibromyalgia is not technically an illness. People with fibromyalgia are not sick, but rather they have a variation in constitution. People with fibromyalgia do not process pain in the same way that other people do. Um, that means they have better or worse times, but it, they're not actually have a disease or an illness that's gonna get progressively worse. Uh, disability justice calls for positive disability identity. And instead of thinking about how the person with fibromyalgia can fix their problems or get better or try to cure it, the amount of time and money I've spent trying to cure fibromyalgia is extraordinary, right? And a disability justice model says, maybe it's ableism rather than the difference that prevents people with fibromyalgia from full and happy lives. For example, no matter how much I do, every day I look around at people with normal pain processing who are doing more, and I think I should be like that, right? When you accept that this is not a short-term illness, but actually a, a state of being, I suddenly have way less FOMO. I have way less sense of um, I'm not doing enough. Like for fibromyalgia, I'm doing amazing. So once I rec like sort of set the standard of, of what my body is and accept that that's an okay standard instead of a deficit model that I'm less than people without this process, it actually incredibly improves uh, mental health. 
And then instead of just changing myself, we can start to look at adapting environment, right? Like creating a work situations that allow for pacing, that allow a more flexible schedule. The first time around when I applied for disability, my doctor said, well, I think you could work, but you would need a job where you can work more on some days and less on another day and, um, and take breaks when you need to and sometimes work from home in your pajamas and only sometimes go into the public. And I'm like, where does that job exist? Well, a college professor is one and hopefully being a therapist is another. So finding these places where these environments where people with fibromyalgia can thrive um, is another way to frame it. And finally, trauma healing and emotional healing can actually intervene in the pain. But let's go back to the first idea. If you can hold the dialectic of client empowerment without blame, if you can see the ways that clients can participate in feeling better and uh, feeling empowered without then saying if they aren't better, it's their fault, then you can proceed with this. <laughs> okay, so as we talked about, EMDR, somatic experiencing, DBT, mindfulness are all things that can reset the autonomic system. And CBT, it, I cringe on it, but here's the way it works in narrative therapy. So we experience pain, but we all actually, we also have narratives about pain. We have pain, then we have the expectation of pain. We have the fear of permanence, right? So in this quote at the top, whenever something painful happens to me amid all the distress, I'm surprised at being reminded of how painful pain is. That thought is always followed by another, what if I hurt like this all the time? Chronic pain syndromes are extraordinary debilitating. So you have the original pain, but then you have the narrative about pain. What does this mean, right? Uh, focusing on the pain, what if I feel this all the time? That actually increases constriction, um, which increases pain. So changing those narratives, uh, one of the most effective therapies I ever had was to have pain and not tell a story about it. To not say, oh, it means this. Oh, it's because of this. And just having pain and not telling a story. And it actually, the pain just stuck around less. Um, this one, it doesn't mean ignore pain, but shifting the focus from pain, there's a theory that if those pathways were once there and got lost, we could maybe recreate the inhibitory pathways by sort of shifting the focus away from the pain and focusing and making those inhibitory pathways recreate. Um, so it can be done negatively, I guess, with distraction. Like it's one of the reasons I'm always playing a game is because it actually distracts my brain from processing pain. If I'm looking at playing like, uh, like Bejeweled or something stupid like that. Um, but you can also do it with meditation where you find parts of your body that don't hurt and sort of focus on those. So yeah, lots of things therapists can do. Sorry this went so long. I'm very excited about this. Um, and hope to continue learning and teaching it.